And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, it's a great day. I mean, it's a great day anytime I can uh, get the master of the best in class ETFs here on screen with me because I spent an hour talking about his work last week. And this week I got him, and he's promised to do something that I know some of you will want to stick around for. And we're going to do it at the last of the podcast because uh, it's going to be a lot of numbers. But uh, Chris is going to take some time going through some analysis, comparing some DFA and some uh, Avantis uh, ETFs. So uh, I think you're going to like that. Those of you who, particularly those of you who are doing some homework on your own, stick around. Uh, but I but I wanted just, just to add a couple things, Chris, because I did spend a, a whole podcast talking about how well uh, your picks had done as a group and uh, how we know some of it is a matter of luck and some of it is a dedication to the to the discipline that you have. But one thing I want I did not say last week, and, and I think it's an interesting aspect of what we're trying to do. We know that over time, or at least we don't know, but we expect that value is going to be better than growth and small is going to be better than large and, and stocks are going to be better than bonds. And we know there'll be long periods that that's not true. But I I did notice something interesting, that when you look at the average returns at Morningstar, and and the best I understand that is if you looked at all of the small cap value uh, ETFs that are in the universe, that, uh, for example, our Avantis small cap value is, in essence, competing with, uh, that average was, in fact, I, I think that average was about well, a, a, a little over 1% uh, lower uh, than the Avantis. Um, but we have to remember something about the concept of average. The, that average means that there were some people who did better than Avantis. <clears throat> we know that because Morningstar actually tells us where these uh, different... Uh, ETFs or mutual funds are in the whole universe. So when you see the number eight down at the bottom uh, of the page on returns and performance, that eight means that it is in the top 8% of all performers. And and Avantis has been really steady uh, in the upper part of performance. But it also means that there are a lot of people who made less than that average. So when we are happy for the folks who followed your work, Chris, we're happy for them. Uh, We also know there are some people who are really disappointed that they didn't do better during a period that in fact, small cap was better than large and value was better than growth by, by a lot. But on average, including the bond recommendations that you made. On average, it was 1.9% more per asset for the each average asset class. I think that's great uh, because, because that means that uh, we're helping people do a lot better. Now, Chris, as you know, we get emails, you get them. I don't because I knew who to come to. They come to you and ask, well, what about this and that? And how would you compare this to, the, to that ETF, et cetera? Um, and uh, uh, I, I know that can be a lot of work, but, but the, 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 I guess a question you should answer so everybody hears, how do you feel about those emails when you get <laughs> I, I In general, I... I like the emails I get because it helps me understand what people are wondering and you know what's on their mind and what they're curious about. And sometimes it flags a new a new fund to me that I haven't seen before. 
Uh, the DFA funds have definitely been on my radar, and I've gotten a lot of emails about those. Uh, Avantis introduced some new funds a little while ago. I've gotten some emails about those as well. And uh, so it, I, I, I don't mind. Uh, I, I like just learning what's on people's mind and what they're curious about, as long as it's not too overwhelming. There are times when life takes a precedent and it takes me a long time to reply. But uh, yeah, it's I generally value them. Um, just wanted to chime in on something you said a minute ago, because I think you made a mistake that I have been guilty of making as well. No, no mistake. No, it's all right. Uh, you know, a I lot of times- I have paid enough to make a mistake. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, a lot of times we, you know, we really lean heavily on analyzing past performance to try and determine what we should do in the future. And we, we do that not just in personal finance, we do, we do that with the weather outside, right? And I think the financial forecasts are kind of like weather forecasts. They're inaccurate, but useful. You know, before I go on a trip, I look at the 10 day forecast and I, I pack accordingly. But if anybody asked me, is the 10 day forecast going to play out exactly the way it says it is, I'd say absolutely not. It's going to be different from that. And I think that the financial work we do looking at the past is similar. There are reasons why uh, things can, you know, but why the climate can change even, right? There are reasons why tomorrow might not be like the past, but we really have no other way to understand what the future might be than to look backwards. And so uh, I think that's an important caveat. And we do believe, based on the past, that a portfolio that leans a little bit towards small and a little bit towards value or even a lot towards small and value over the long term will likely outperform. But we also believe that it's going to perform very differently from the market at large. And it's going to require a lot of patience and and persistence to get it. And so... For some people, being less different will probably be better because their portfolio will perform more consistently over time. Yeah. Well, as long as you brought this topic up, a guy named Jeff lives right here on Bainbridge. Uh, wrote us a thoughtful, a, a thoughtful note about this basing things on the past. And I was, it was really interesting. I did not call him to, to, to talk about it, but I, I'm going to read a little bit of it, if I might, Chris. Uh, I had mentioned the idea that nobody knows nothing. That's a quote out of uh, John Bogle. That's not an original for me. Uh, but he says, I agree with you that nobody knows nothing. And as a long-term investor and a Boglehead, I have made no changes to my retirement and brokerage portfolios other than rebalancing to the original mix since I retired in 2016. However, this is not because I believe that the past 94 years shown in the quilt chart have any predictive power whatsoever. It could be that the past 94 years were an aberration, a unique century characterized by American stability, homogeny, homogeny, and regulatory and social norms that were themselves condu conductive to conducive to long-term planning. Many of the features of the 20th century uh, that produce the results in the quilt chart are very, are either disappearing or under attack or were products of a unique uh, global and, and uh, uh, national economy. And he goes on and on. And, um, and then he, he says that uh, I stick to my financial plan because I don't have a better plan, not because I believe in charts and quilt charts and, uh, uh, and the real world crisis in which they exist. Uh, that They are a great way to portray the past but a poor way to discuss the future. And, um, and so we work so hard to produce long-term studies with the idea that if they can see 90 years worth of data, it will give them more information and more confidence that they're headed in the right way. Uh, and yet here's somebody, smart guy, uh, probably uh, knows the economy well and, and, and the market well, 
But what do you say to somebody like Jeff? Um, can we can we be of any help of at all <laughs> to people like Jeff? Or or do people actually have to start with the belief that they can learn from the past when they look at our work? You know, one thing that is comforting about Jeff's letter is that he's exhibiting some good buy and hold behavior. Yeah. He's sticking with one plan and he's not letting the news of the day push him around. But if there really is no informational power in the past, then why stick with that plan? Why adopt the plan he's got? why not invest in crypto and i don't know maybe some commodities and toss some real estate in there and oh we should have some gold and i you know i if you his plan had to be based on something and he's at a point now where his his commitment to the plan may be based on its recent past performance where recent is the decades he's been involved in it and that might be okay. He's probably going to do just fine. But I think it's a little disingenuous to say that he places absolutely no uh, predictive value on the past because otherwise he wouldn't be in any plan. He, 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 would, he would flail minute to minute, day to day, because he would have absolutely no idea what to do. I so, but but I understand I understand the sentiment, and you know it's kind of an extreme view. I think the the other extreme view would be to say that the past history we have guarantees that you know small cap value will have a premium in the future, and and we don't believe that. We don't believe there's any guarantees. We believe the future is unknown, and it depends on a wide range of of things that we can't see or know, but. I still feel the best predictor of the future is the past. I don't have a better a better source. So I think I, I've got an idea of where Jeff is coming from. I had lunch yesterday with about 10, well, I guess there about nine young people uh, who are well, young compared to me, uh, who work with the old firm that I used to work with. And uh, uh, we were talking about what is the secret to, to being a successful investor, particularly if, if you're not working with a professional and you're doing it on your own. And I think at the end of the day, if I had a chance to talk to Jeff, it would turn out that what he trusted was not in, on, in a direct way the past, but he trusted John Bogle. He's a boglehead, and he trusted a person who definitely knew the past. I suspect trusted the past, the past uh, in 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 his in his work. And so, my point I made to these young people yesterday is that maybe the real secret to long-term success as an investor is to have trusted the right source of advice. And then, of course, you have to know what they're what they're looking at. But sometimes we just find somebody we trust, and it lasts a long time. Which reminds me of a question that I got from a, a young fellow that just started investing for the first time, and he's setting up a Roth IRA, and he's going to use small cap value. He's going to do the five year plan of putting all the uh, IRA money uh, into small cap value, and then not adding more money there, but going to a more traditional kind of a portfolio. And in a sense, he's trusting you, Chris, because he actually read your book. And he read my book that Rich Buck wrote. And, um, and, and he wanted to know, what does he do when we're dead? Who does he trust then? Yeah, these chains of trust are kind of interesting because it because it's not it's not like there's an end point. Um, you know, if if he's trusting me or you or Rich or our work collectively, he's also indirectly trusting the academic work of Fama and French 
and many other academics who've come since them. You know, and people who trusted John Bogle still get value out of that trust because I think he was a gifted teacher whose lessons will outlast his lifetime by a long ways. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's a very, I, I think you're absolutely right that some, the determining who you trust is really important and where their sources came from. I think though that even when you start by trusting someone, you have the opportunity to build your own knowledge. A lot of people don't have the patience to do that. And that's part of the reason they invest in a trust-based kind of approach is that they don't wanna do the hard work. But for example, um, Bogle had a strong bias towards the US market. And I've thought a lot about that, about why why might the US have done really well for the past hundred years and why might it continue to do well or not continue to do well? And, uh, you know, the, the um, the legal system we have that protects personal rights, I think, is is uh, among the best in the world. Maybe not the best in the world, but it's among the best. There's kind of a vibrant chaos to our economy that is unique. Uh, it's um, you know, so that seems to still be there as it was in the past century. Uh, but like like you say, you can always argue the uh, the good news in column A and the bad news in column B. I could, my grandfather used to say I should be a lawyer because I could argue either side of any argument. Um, you know, the other side is that we had the wind at our back uh, for the last century in terms of demographics. You know, we had a growing population that uh, fueled a lot of economic growth. And whether that continues through immigration or doesn't, you know, that that's interesting. And you know, there, there are uh, global rivals that are a lot bigger. So, you know, I, I think I, my, my hope is that people who start with trust over time uh, do a little more work, maybe not all at once, but do a little more work to learn and develop uh, their own foundation of knowledge. And that's, that's what we try to do here is, uh, is help, help people go beyond just trusting us to understanding the the numbers and the history behind the thinking so that when we're gone, they have something else to lean on. And the, the question still remains, I think, for this young fellow is he's in the Avantis Small Cap Value Fund for five years. I mean, he's investing in it for five years. Then it goes to sleep. It's like Rip Van Winkle. It is there. Uh, alive and kicking, but it's not to be looked at and not to be used until he's 65 or 60 or 70, whatever he chooses. Then he goes in and he takes 5% out a year to live on. And then he continues to hold that just as he might hold a business that he uh, had built uh, while he was a working guy but he's gonna to continue to own that business and reap the rewards from that business, understanding that businesses go up and down. But what he wants to know from somebody he can trust or have that sense, will it be okay just to leave it in the Avanta Small Cap Value Fund? Are the odds uh, in his favor that if small cap value does in fact do well for the long term, that Avanta small cap value should be just fine. I think the odds are in his favor. And to me, the plan he's executing follows in many respects the some of the, the six best words of financial advice that I know. Buy right, hold tight, don't peek. And those come from John Bogle, and he would take issue with recommending a small cap value fund. He'd say, just put it in the total market. And I think the reason he would is that the vast majority of people aren't gonna learn about a different asset class and, and they're going to get impatient when it doesn't track the market, when the market outperforms and they may sell at the wrong time. I think for somebody who's willing to learn that they're gonna to have to tolerate that tracking error and willing to do as John recommended, look away, don't peek, um, 
they've got a very good chance of doing very well. And I base that on the 90 plus years of history we have looking back at how that asset class is done and the history of what happens when funds change hands over time. Um, I think it's very likely if Avantis were to go out of business or be acquired or whatever that 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 fund would get subsumed into another small cap value fund or uh, you know that it would it would transition in some way that was manageable so yeah i think i think it's a great strategy it's one some several of my kids are following um i think it uh it also has this really nice behavioral attribute that on the front end, when he's doing regular contributions, his drawdowns are are buffered. He's not going to see as much volatility and he gets to kind of grow into adapting to the volatility he has to experience uh, so that by the time he gets to retirement and and he opens it and looks at it and looks back at the history, he can say, wow, this was really volatile, but it had a good return. So as a retiree taking money out, hopefully he'll he'll have that perspective to stay committed to it because he'll be able to see that that volatility was worth the ride, it, worth it. Yeah. You just brought up a topic in, in your in your comments about uh, the total market index. And I find it interesting. I mean, the argument for the total market index is that it isn't all the S&P 500 that it does have some value and so it's good because value did better than growth so that would be a positive for the total market index and and it has some smaller companies and smaller companies did better than large companies last year generally not by a ton but better and yet why is it that the total market index at vanguard is down unless i've got my numbers wrong is is down over 21 21.3 percent while the s p 500 is down 20. now i know that's not a huge difference but why didn't somehow the way that they have built their portfolio so that they can tell people we got enough small cap value here we got enough large cap value here we're we're we're, we're matching what the market looks like and yet, when we put together some small, some value, some small blend, some large value, and large blend, we come up with a return for that same period. I believe it's a minus 14.7% or something like that. Okay? Why? Why, does, why is the total market index losing more than the S&P 500. Now I'm sure there's a simple answer and I have not taken the time to go to, to go look at how much they have in all the different industries. First of all, the total market index, it, even though it includes some small, it, it includes some value, uh, it also includes enough growth and enough large to give you z practically zero meaningful exposure to those. Uh, it's it's almost like, um, you know, trying to make something uh, sweeter at the same time you're trying to make it sour, right? You know, you if you add sweet and sour both at the same time, they kind of, they can offset each other. Uh, it's not a great analogy, but but you get the idea. One of them is is pushing in one direction and the other is pushing in the other direction. And when you combine them, you end up with net zero. So you don't end up in the total market with any meaningful exposure to the smaller, the value parts of the market that isn't offset by the growth and the large parts. Uh, if you look at the Vanguard S&P 500, it, in addition to being large and growth, it does have a little bit of exposure to some quality attributes of the market um, and in contrast the total market does not because again you know whatever quality exposure is there is offset by by the exposure to junk so to speak so uh you know in different regimes you're gonna see different performance sometimes one will outperform the other uh, but 
the the biggest argument I see for the total market for somebody investing in the total market instead of the S and P five hundred is regret avoidance. If you invest in the total market, you've got thousands and thousands of companies. And when somebody you know approaches you at a party and says, "Hey, you know, did you hear about X Y Z?" You can go, "I've got some." Right. And I, th I think that that's very valuable for some investors. But in terms of its impact on the, the total return of the portfolio, uh, they're, as we know, historically, they're both going to be pretty close to the same. And in any one period of time, they, they could go a little e either way. Okay, well, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, Vanguard. Vanguard underproduced the best in class ETFs. That is obviously because they're different. Uh, they're inexpensive. And some people, by the way, don't want to go to the best in class ETFs because they have to pay a higher expense ratio to be in the best in class ETF. But that difference between Vanguard, I noticed, for example, I looked at the four US, the four fund US strategy. Uh, with Vanguard, the loss was 16.6. The loss with the best in class was 14.2. That's a fairly good size difference. Uh, if the world stops right then and then you get the same return for the next 100 years, you're going to pick up that 2% that difference is going to be in there cranking away forever. But um, uh, any any comment because because you know you've been kind enough to to accommodate the Vanguard investors who want to use Vanguard and yet I suspect you do believe that the best in class should perform better over time not just for six months uh, any comment about that the Vanguard investor is absolutely right in one way in that your expenses get paid regularly every single quarter month whenever they're taken you know year so it, the, the expenses are guaranteed the added return is hypothetical and statistical it comes in sometimes and sometimes it doesn't and so there is a uh, uh you know and um when you analyze your portfolio, I would encourage everybody to figure out how much they're paying in total expenses. That is something, um, depending on where you do your your trading, it may or may not be easy for you to figure out, but it's, it's worth the half hour that it might take you to calculate it. Uh, that has been an eye-opening calculation for us multiple times uh, along our investing journey. Because as your assets grow, those small percentages become bigger dollars. And when you run the numbers, sometimes you're, you're going to pause and say, I can't believe I paid $10,000 to firm XYZ to, you know, for, for added value because I'm not getting added value. So I, I would encourage everybody to run the numbers and figure out what their expenses are. Now, having said all of that, uh, why do, why do I favor, um, buying slightly more expensive funds uh, rather than just being the cheapest. It's the same reason I buy slightly more expensive other products. You know, I, I get more value out of them. So when we're buying us, I'll just take a small cap value fund as example. I'm looking for exposure to the small part of the market, exposure to the value part of the market. And I know that those give me an added one to three percent uh, of expected return. So if I can buy a fund that costs me 0.1% more in expense ratio, but gives me 20% more exposure uh, to the to the factor, which has a 3% return, 0.6%, that'd be worth it. Yeah, that'd be worth it. So, you know, do you want to buy the cheapest spice when you go to the store, even though it has no flavor, or are you going to buy something for a little bit more money that you can actually taste? That's kind of what we're looking at. And when I run the numbers on the best in class analysis, that's what I look at is how much exposure do I get to these factors and what are the premiums worth and how much does it cost me to get them? And when you, when you multiply those out, it becomes pretty clear 
that something like the Avantis small cap value fund is worth it over what you would get in a, uh, a Vanguard fund? So another thing, question we get often is about mid cap. And as I was, as opposed to holding some large and some small, why don't you just use mid cap and that will be about the same return. And I just happened to note, since I was taking the time to look at these returns for the first six months, that the uh, mid cap value fund at, uh, and this is at Vanguard, uh, lost 13%. Uh, as opposed to a combination of the large cap value and the small cap value, uh, lost 10%. So there was a 3% difference. Now, that's six months. But, but have you thought through yourself the, the implications of the very large and very small value or growth or whatever one is trying to, is, to achieve there? Uh, of going the mid cap versus the combination of the two edges? The way our portfolios are constructed with the, the edges, um, we're, we're looking for funds that don't overlap very much and that give us some diversification, some, some difference in the funds that we hold uh, because we're, uh, we're hoping over time to hold, hold things that uh, perform well in different economic regimes, right? In a period of inflation, small in value is gonna tend to do a little better. In a period of low inflation, as we saw in recent years, large growth did pretty well. Uh, so it it's good to have the variety in there if you want more consistent performance in the portfolio. It, you could create the portfolio with mid caps uh, instead of the the large caps and tilt even more to small to small in value, but you could do the same thing by holding a greater percentage of your portfolio in small in value. So really, at that point, it's just a question of you know how aggressive are you trying to be? How much are you trying to place the very long term bet that? small in value will outperform um, versus having a portfolio that performs consistently in a wide wider range of circumstances. The other thing is in a taxable account, uh, every time you trade, you potentially are incurring a fee. And so if you have a mid cap and you've got a small cap and they overlap, you may find yourself trading to rebalance where what you're really doing is selling the same stocks in one fund to buy them in a different fund and just paying tax on it for very little difference in the rebalance. Where if you have things that are more different with the large and the small, then then the the overlap is is probably zero if not you know very very close to zero and so you're being more efficient in your trading for the rebalancing. That is one thing that uh I thought was very exciting when I I looked at the two fund, the small cap value and the S and P 500, and to, to realize that uh, they work out at the edges, both yeah. of them, almost all the time. I mean, it's a majority of the time they are out at the edges, and and that's a big deal. And if you're trying to take advantage of of rebalancing within these two asset classes that you think are both good for the long term, but maybe you get a little extra through the rebalancing. Not always, but maybe. And by the way, just to, 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 to comment about that, the, the two fund strategy, S&P 500, by the way, it's not the S&P 500 that you use. You use a, a fund that is a slightly smaller, right? And uh, is it slightly more value oriented by chance? Slightly smaller, slightly more value oriented, oriented, and a little bit of a, a quality kind of bump in there as well. Yeah. Um, and it did well less. I mean, when I say it did well, it still lost money, but in, instead of losing 20%, it lost 18.3%. And that's the, that's the ETF that you have in place for the large cap blend rather than the S&P 500. But 
that large cap blend and the small cap value together uh, lost 16%. So I, I really am hopeful that that is going to be a great combination for people who are looking for something really simple. They do want some small, they do want some value, but they don't want to spend any time doing it. And they want to have a lot of quality in their portfolio, which they get out of the S&P 500. And by the way, they get a fair amount of small cap quality in dealing with Avandas because that is a focus of their work as well, correct? Yes. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, I'm looking at all these questions and things that we got. If you just be patient for one second here. Um, question about risk. There's a fellow who wants us to do a major study on our article and podcast about what is risk. And please I mean, shoot me down if it's what you believe, but help me through this thing that I'm developing in terms of a belief. And that is when the strategy that you have, the portfolio that you have over long periods of time has a more dependable, successful return, profitable return uh, than the other. Is that less risky? And I'm talking just for, for the sake of discussion about something like the S&P 500 and the small cap value. We all know small cap value is more risky than the large companies of the S&P 500, but when I look at decades, look at all the decades or the 10 years of return, the return is much more dependable. Maybe that's not the right word to use, but what is your comment about th that risk? Is it less risky if more of the time it produces a better return that gives you a higher probability of getting where you want to go? Yeah, I think uh, was the founder of the AAII uh, Clooney. Is that right? Clooney. Clooney. Thank you. Yeah, he he had. Uh, I think by the end of his life, he'd kind of uh, come to the a similar idea that that the risk of equities, and you could extend it to small and value equities, is is kind of a phantom risk for a long term buy and hold investor, uh, because for somebody who really is going to stay the course and has a managed portfolio in these asset classes at the end of a very long period of time that you're you're going to do well uh, i i got pushed back on that kind of a concept from larry swedro in my book saying that there's uh there's the same risk at the end that there was at the beginning which is true. So you may have a bigger portfolio, but you still have to look at it through the lens of I might not have 50% of it tomorrow. Or if it's small cap value, maybe it's 60% of it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's always going to be risk with these more volatile assets. Uh, but I, I think that the conventional wisdom is is right that if you are a long-term buy and hold investor, you're better off being an owner than a loner. You're, you're better off uh, owning equity and sharing in business success than you are uh, being a debt holder and being purely in bonds. Now, there are entire civilizations that have crashed. So there, you know, there is that possibility that things go catastrophically wrong and, and you lose it all. Uh, the risk of that, I think, in, in our society is probably small, but it's not zero. Yeah. Uh, and that argues for diversification internationally and, and uh, you know, potentially diversification into other asset classes as well. So it's always good to diversify, but yeah, I, th I, think, I think the risk, uh, for somebody who's willing to stay the course, um, 
you know, there's always that volatility risk that hangs over the balance that you see at the end. But in general, people are probably better better off uh, taking the equity risk than they would be just playing it safe for the whole ride. Well, and if you think about it, for the young investor, the fact that it's highly risky, but but always, at least historically, successful over the long term, that's okay that they go through a really bad period if if they have the staying power to leave it there to come back. Especially if they're dollar cost averaging in and buying it when it's cheap during that bad time. Yep. And to the, like you say, to the extent that because you stayed the course with equities, then when you get old, er, that you then give a substantial amount back. But if you've got a huge additional return in your pocket, uh, it may be you're still going to be miles ahead, uh, taking a bigger loss, but from a much bigger base. Anyway, thanks uh, for the comment. Now, I have no idea how long we've been chatting. I know I want to leave time for you to be able to go through uh, uh, an analysis and give people an idea of some of your thinking when you're picking uh, ETFs. Well, we had another email and it gets right at this question of Avantis versus DFA ETFs. Mm -hmm. um, so David writes, I, I hope this email finds you well. I'm a longtime listener and a big fan of the work you all are doing. It is much appreciated. It has definitely changed my life. I hope I can share what I've learned. And then he says, I, I have a question for you to see if you have any additional thoughts. I'm looking at the comparison between DFA and Avantis ETFs. And then he does something that inspires me to no end. He actually shows me his work that he's been doing um, using his, I believe this is his, uh, yeah, his Schwab account. So he goes in, he looks and he compares the US and the international uh, uh, small cap value from DFA and Avantis. And he shows that the uh, expense ratios are close, but Avantis is a little bit cheaper. So, you know, 25 basis points versus 31 for the US and 36 versus 42 for the international. And then he looks at the PE ratios and, um, you know, he finds that. Uh, yeah, you know, this is interesting. He says um, that uh, Avantis has a smaller PE ratio and it has a higher sales growth, cash flow, and growth to book value. And he asks, "Do I have any additional insight on this?" So I'll 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 show you how I would look at this a little differently in a in a minute. But and he also looks at size and he says there's slightly smaller size for DFA on the international side. Uh, and then he looks at sector weightings and shows that, you know, the sector weightings are a little bit different and Avantis has more of a tilt to energy. And that's going to change over time as as these different industries come in and out of favor. And he finishes out by by mentioning portfolio visualizer. So I, what I find interesting about this process, uh, other than the fact that he's just got the patience to go in and and actually do some of the homework himself, is how easy it is to find a lot of information but not get to a conclusion. And Paul, I think you've recommended an alternative approach, and I use this sometimes too, so let me hop over there, and that's to use Morningstar. So if we come over and we look at Morningstar, we get a lot of the same kind of information. We get uh, the expense ratios, so this is the Avantis US small cap value. Um, we can also look at the portfolio and we can see how how the portfolio tilts and we can see Avantis small cap value down here in the bottom left hand corner and we can do the same thing for the DFA fund see the higher expense ratio second, Chris to that style box uh, we might have a lot of people who've never seen that style box want to just comment on that yeah yeah so when we go to the portfolio in Morningstar this style box is showing us on the vertical axis, small, medium, and large. And on the horizontal axis, it's showing us value, blend, and growth. So these being small cap value funds, 
you would hope that they'd be in this bottom left hand corner and what you see is that um the uh they show you what the the normal or average small cap value fund is they show you what the avantis fund is and it's farther it's farther down into the left which is saying it's more valuey and a little bit smaller than the average and you can then see some of the numbers down here it'll show you price to earnings and it'll also also show you market cap so the avantis fund has price to earnings of 6.63 and a market cap of 2.2 billion if we go to the DFA one, it has a price to earnings of 8.15. So that's actually less value -y, And it has a market cap of 2.3 billion. And that was compared to 2.2 billion. So it's a little bit larger. So, so another so thing here, uh, Chris, is right next to the average market cap is the category average. Yes. And, and one of the reasons you get these very different returns is because within this so-called small cap value, there's a wide range of size, a, a wide range of, uh, of PE ratios and, uh, and, and, and quality. Now, I'm curious, as I look at quality on the, the and maybe you're going to go talk about this, but uh, it looks relatively low as a factor in dfa is that fair or am i mis so uh the dfa quality over here on the left hand side is a little bit below the category average and if we look at avantis it's a little bit above the category average which oh. is what we would expect um and if we want to go just a little bit deeper on on those i like to use um portfolio visualizer and you can go into portfolio visualizer and you can do a, a back test to just look at how these two have performed there's not that much history because of avantis we only go back to september of 2019 but you can see that avantis has outperformed by a little bit um, over this period of time but there was a time early on when avantis had underperformed so the short-term performance, and that's all I would say this graph is, could go either way depending on market conditions. What I find more meaningful, though, is you can run a portfolio uh, or, or a factor regression on Portfolio Visualizer. So you type in the assets here, and then you select a, a factor model. And I like to use Fama in French because they're, they're academics, and I use a five-factor model. And when, when we look at that, it tells us that both of these funds have very high exposure to risk of market minus risk of fixed, or that's the market risk factor, just what you get for investing in the stock market. Um, Avantis actually gives you a little more exposure to that factor. And that is one of the wow. biggest factors, which is kind of interesting. Avantis gives you a little more exposure to the small factor it gives you about the same exposure to the value factor it gives you a little more exposure to rich minus weak which is a uh, a characteristic of quality it gives you negative exposure to conservative minus aggressive um, which is not a good thing you'd rather have positive exposure there and then there's this this bucket called alpha, which is, you know, after they run the regression and they do all of the analysis and they try and fit all of the returns to these characteristics of the market that they know what's left over. And you would expect that to be negative for an expense ratio. Over this period of time, um, it's a little more positive for Avantis than it is for DFA. Uh, whether that's significant or not, if you come down here and you look at the alpha, um, you'll see that Avantis shows a range of negative to positive, the 95% confidence interval. And the same thing is true for DFA. So I wouldn't put too much stock in the alpha number. Um, I would put more stock in the expense ratio because I know the expense ratio is accurate. The alpha number here is a bit of a swag. 
But the last piece of information that's really useful is this R squared, because it tells you how much of the performance is explained by this model. And if there's a wizard behind the, the, the curtain who's doing a bunch of magical stuff to try and time the market and do a bunch of what we would think of as active investing, then this number would be low. But the fact that it's 98.2% for Avantis and 992 for DFA says that both of them are following a disciplined, systematic, mechanized approach behind the curtain. There is no wizard that, that I have to count on being equally good today as he is five years from now or 10 years from now. Basically, I'm buying when I buy either of these funds, I'm buying a systematic approach to investing. And provided they don't change that system, I should expect the future to be similar to the to the past in terms of how well it taps these different attributes of the market. The final piece of the equation is like, what does all this add up to? Is is the Avantis one or the DFA one better? To answer that question, we need one more piece of information. And we need to know how much each of these is worth in terms of its annual return. So to find that out, we go to Portfolio Visualizer and we've been using factor regression. Now we're going to go to factor statistics and we're going to click view statistics for the Fama French statistics. And we're going to look at the very long term premiums, not just the premiums for the short term we have the history on. And the reason we're going to do that is that we don't know what period of time we're going to live through. And we're counting on these funds to be consistently managed and give us consistent exposure to these factors over time. Now, it won't be perfect, but it, it'll be close. So for the market return, we can see that it has an annualized premium or return expect expectation of 5.6% based on its past. Uh, the size premium, we're going to use FF3 because that's consistent with what's done in the regressions. It has a premium of 1.83% per year. The value premium is 3.11% per year. And the profitability premium, uh, rich minus week, is 3.03%. And the investment premium, conservative minus aggressive, was 3.39%. So what I've done is I've created a spreadsheet here where I took those premiums that we just talked about, and I put them up here as the long-term factor premiums in percent per year. Then I've got the Avantis AVUV factor loads, and those came from back here our factor regression, right? So if you look at the Avantis factor regression, it was 1.06, 0 0.89, 0 0.57, 0 0.22, minus 0 0.12. And if you look over here, that's what we've got, 1.06, 0 0.89, 0 0.57, 0 0.22, minus 0 0.12. So then we multiply those times the long-term expected premiums for each of these different factors. And we get the expected return contribution of the exposure to each of those parts of the market. And we sum it up and we get 9.65% per year. And as I said before, I tend to ignore the alpha because I don't really expect any of these funds to have a practical magic secret sauce that lets them beat the market. What I expect them to have is an expex expense ratio <laughs> that I have to pay. So I replace that with this expense ratio and I subtract it from that expected return. And for Avantis, I get 9.4% annual return, which would be very good. And by the way, that 9.4% is above a risk-free return. So we would expect if the risk-free return in the marketplace was 3% or 2%, um, that that would be two or three percent higher. So let's, let's be conservative and say the risk-free return in the market is 2% then the expected return for Avantis would be 11.4%, which is in line with a good small cap value fund. So how did DFA do in comparison? Well, I've typed in the load factors. Again, these come from the factor regression. So you can see them here on the factor regression page. And you can see I've typed in those numbers of 98 basis points, 76, 56, 12, and minus 0.03. There they are, 98, 76, 56, 
12 minus 0.03. And we do the same multiplication again, and we add them up, and you get 8.93% is the total of all of those premiums times the load factors. And we subtract the 0.31%, slightly higher expense ratio, and we get a total expected return of 8.62%. So at the end of the day, would I change my recommendation today from DFA to Avantis? No, I wouldn't. Would I have a problem with somebody who wanted to invest in Avantis or, or DFA instead of Avantis for small cap value? No, I wouldn't. Um, would I promise you one of these will do better than the other over time? No, I wouldn't. Uh, they're, they're very, very close funds. And by the way, for this young fellow who is putting away this money into small cap value and is worried that we're not going to live forever to be here to guide him on, how about if I told him, suggested that he just split it between DFA and Avantis? Any problem with that? Uh, you know, these are both great companies that are very well founded in academic research uh, I, it's hard for me to see somebody really going wrong with one over the other. I think they, they're, they're both really good. So splitting it would be fine. It just, it complicates the portfolio a little unnecessarily, but if it lets him sleep better at night or makes him comfortable with the choice and gets him going, that's well worth it. Well, Chris, I'm hoping that we're going to get a whole bunch of feedback. Now, I don't know if a whole bunch of feedback is three emails or a dozen telling us whether this kind of work that you just did is, is something they'd like us to do or you to do uh, periodically. And, and uh, uh, to, because there are people I know from the emails, uh, they may appreciate what we're doing, but it's not good enough. They want to take it one step further and look for their own best in class. So uh, I don't know how large that number is, but uh, we'll wait for feedback. I suspect there's also a group of people who want the simpler story. And uh, for them, I think maybe we want to include a link in the show notes to a, a podcast that Rob Berger did recently. Mm. Uh, he was challenged to... Uh, to answer the question, does Avantis play, should Avantis have a place in my portfolio? And he specifically looked at the Avantis US small cap value fund versus VTWV Vanguards. And he did it uh, with a little bit less of a, a, a new, a little bit less numerical rigor yep. and came to the conclusion that for somebody who wants to include a tilt to small in value, it's a good choice. Uh, so and and I think you know in his mind it was similar to the question you just asked me. You know, VTWV would be a fine choice too, but uh, I think Rob does a really nice job of going through uh, that trade-off analysis in a little bit less number-centric way. Uh, that's also valuable. And if I may add, he has not been disclosed yet as one of our truth tellers. But he is on the list, and this year, because we're trying to do one a month, uh, he will be one of the folks that, uh, when we're not around to help people, uh, we think that Rob Berger is is one of the real good guys, smart guys, uh, and dedicated to help to helping people. I really admire him, and and I sense zero conflict with Rob. Uh, you know, he used to write for Fortune and he did have a website uh, that was advertising funded, but he's since sold that. And I think all of the work he does now uh, through his YouTube channel and his podcasts is motivated by a pure and simple desire to help. And yeah, he makes some money off of his YouTube channel, but uh, yeah, he's not, I don't, I don't think he needs the money and I don't think he's doing it to make the money. I think he, his motives are pure and uh and his ability to explain things is high so yeah he's he's a good an guy attorney. what's that hi he's a retired attorney yes he does know how to explain stuff i i'll give him a uh, hundred on that well i really appreciate it chris as always i got lots more questions but you know i've been told that uh our our podcasts sometimes go too long great stuff from you today thank you very much 
and uh, we'll look forward to doing this soon. We'll have, I think we'll have our friend Daryl back in the next uh, month or two. He's working on an exciting project right now, something having to do with the stars, the real stars, I think, if I'm a, or maybe I'm wrong. But whatever it is, he is, he, he is having fun. And, um, and I hope you're having fun. I know I'm having Very fun. much so, yeah. Good, good. Thank you, Chris. And we'll see the rest of you next week. And uh, keep the emails coming. We, we, we love the feedback. We actually do appreciate it when somebody donates to our 501c3 foundation to help us reach more people. Uh, later this month, I'm going to be doing a, um, a, a video for first-time investors. And uh, I'm quite excited about that. In fact, there'll be three uh, videos, not too long. One of them will be focusing on the work of uh, Chris Pedersen with his two funds for life and, uh, and one on we're talking millions. And one is going to be on how to build your own personal best portfolio. So I hope you'll all stay tuned and share our work with others. Thank you all very much and have a great day. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Paul. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com, and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.